you were in Israel yes. since the war started. Mm -hmm, How mm -hmm. was that trip? Uh, the most uh, powerful experience of my life. Really? I'm sure, yeah. Why? Um, you know, you just... Are you thinking of someone in particular? Um. It's me! You, you, you hear what I'm telling you? In my mind, I created it. Don't you? I created it, and it's real! Don't you understand? Hello everyone and welcome to Struggle Session. I'm your host, Leslie Lee the Third. Thank you so much for joining us today. Whether you're listening to us on Spreaker, on Spotify, or if you've subscribed to get all our episodes commercial free, including dozens of bonus episodes and movie commentaries, which of course you can get at patreon.com slash struggle session, struggle session.substack.com, or just go to sesh.show for those links as well as Supercast. Once again, thank you to all our subscribers, all the people who've shared the show, given us five-star reviews, anybody listening on YouTube. Any of your support helps tremendously. We got a huge show for you today. Stepping into the ring for the first time. You've seen her on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. You've seen her on Netflix. Writer, stand-up comedian, Kate Willett, joins us today. Has a brand new comedy special. It's very funny. You can check it out on Apple TV and Amazon. Kate and I had a wonderful discussion about comedy, the state of stand-up comedy, the state of some stand-up comedians. You can kind of count this as de facto Meltdown May episode, since we don't do those anymore, but... This is kind of in the spirit of one. Seinfeld, Schumer, Gillis, cancel culture, IDF support. We get into all the things that comedians are very much into today. Again, thank you to everyone who subscribes, who listens, or who hits us up on the email, the struggle session at gmail.com. You can send us text or you can send us voice for your voicemails. Oh, before I forget, at the top of the show, the audio was of Barry Weiss and Jerry Seinfeld and their sit-down interview. I would not recommend watching it, but that clip is a very uh, good sampling of what they had going on over there. Two sociopaths trying to mimic human feeling and not being able to bounce off one another. Very weird, very weird, but that's all you need to hear. Anyway, enjoy the show. I went to this therapist, like a real therapist, and... Uh, I walked into her office and this shit was like covered in crystals, you know, if you see crystals there, like I'm not saying she doesn't believe in vaccines, but she has some questions, you know, <laughs> like I told her I was feeling upset and she was like, how long have you been feeling that way? And, you know, I was like about three months I've been depressed and she's like, have you ever looked into astrology? <laughs> I'm a white woman from California. Obviously, I've looked into astrology. <laughs> like, astrology just feels like such a hard cope with, like, late capitalism, you know? Because it's like, well, 
you know, do we have a lot of problems because uh, five guys own all the money and the stuff? Or is there mercury retrograde? <laughs> Are we in a climate crisis or is it Scorpio season? Like, So Kate, I feel like we've known each other for a while. We've met in person, but you've never come on Struggle Session. I've promised to have you on so many times. I apologize, but I'm so happy to finally have you on today. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited to be on. I'm so excited to have you today because you have some something big to share with the Struggle Session audience, something I just got done watching. Yeah, you have a brand new comedy special called Loophole. What is it special about? What is the loophole? I look, I'm looking at the cover right now, and it's an amazing cover. You are seemingly wearing some sort of... I would say domestic goddess slash millennial dominatrix outfit <laughs> on the cover of this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, my special was, uh, it was thinking about, you know, the different sort of expectations that I feel um, as a woman, you know, coming from different directions, like, you know, these very traditional expectations to be feminine, um, you know, domestic, but then also like, you know, the set of expectations to, you know, succeed um, in, in a, a, a lean in kind of like girl <laughs> boss type fashion. And, you know, it just also like expectations that I feel from, you know, like men that I've dated to be, you know, just like whatever sex goddess kind of constantly down for anything. And uh, to me, like th the title, like loopholes was about finding, um, you know, just like, you know, like it's never possible to live up to all of these expectations at all, you know? So it's like finding, finding the loopholes in, in whatever set of rules exist. You know, your description of it right now sounds like a much better version of the America Ferrara speech from Barbie. Oh yeah, I guess that is kind of true. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So I, before we get into the special or the other topics we want to talk about today, which we'll we'll be diving into the world of stand up comedy, because as as you uh, allude to on the special, you know, stand ups are the philosophers of our time, specifically the early Greek ones due the, to their similar views on the age of consent. <laughs> so we'll be talking about how stand up comedy is, you know, reasserting itself in the world of today. But before we get into that. Let's talk a little bit about how the hell do you make up stand up special? You know, I think there's a few different ways that people make them these days. Um, so, you know, sometimes people will make them directly with a streamer like Netflix. Um, I've done one like that. Um, and, you know, they they take care of everything. You just you sell the special to the streamer before um, they even, you know, make it. And, you know, then then the streamer itself is in charge of the production. And like, you know, that's that's how all like Dave Chappelle's specials got made. And like, that's how like, you know, a very, um, you know, celebrity person will will get their specials made. And then there's a second way, which a lot of comedians are doing these days, um, which is to make a special with a production company. Um, one the, the one that I worked with is uh, Comedy Dynamics. Um, and, you know, so you, you make a, a special with a production company and then where the special lives is decided after you make it. So for me, you can see my stuff on, you know, Amazon and Apple TV. And then another thing that a lot of comedians are doing these days are, you know, self-producing their specials and, you know, just making something, putting it on YouTube. And even really huge comedians have, have done that, you know, like, um, and people have, you know, really, I think, blown up as a result of doing that. Like, you know, Stavros is special, Stavros Halkius, you know, he did one like that. And then, like, it just really, you know, led to a lot of people knowing about his work. And I think he did his second special after that on Netflix. So those are really the three ways now. And I did mine the second way. There is a fourth way that uh, I heard of, and is that you know you're friends with Spike Lee and you call him and ask him to direct it. And I think this way worked for Cat Williams. Oh, okay, yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are some of the things that people who haven't seen your stand-up can expect from the show? Um, so, you know, I think that 
I mean, like, I'm queer, I'm a feminist, so, like, my my work is, is from that perspective. I'm also a socialist, so, you know, it's not it's not very political special, but there there's definitely some some stuff in there. You know, I think that, like, I'm trying to think about what to expect. I mean, for me, like, stand-up is all about, like, writing jokes and telling jokes, you know, but um, I think that, like, I think if if you want like a a special that's not a uh, right wing, this is could be a good option for you. It's also, I mean, I'm not trying. I can't really like toot my own horn too much, but I I think that there's you know a lot of just jokes in there that you know everyone could could enjoy regardless of their politics. It's a lot about like sex and relationships. Yeah, it was very strange because when I was watching it, I didn't see the 15 minute bit on cancel culture, which I thought was a requirement of a stand up comedy special. <laughs> yeah, there's no stuff on cancel culture. Well, I guess there kind of is, but from a sort of making fun of it perspective. Yeah. Look, uh, and Kate, we're beating around the bush, okay? Like, you got to be honest with me. You got to be honest with the listeners. Is the extreme left and PC crap? Did it hurt your TV comedy special? Because that's what Jerry Seinfeld uh, noted, um, not noted for stand-up, more like he's noted for playing a stand-up on TV more than he is his actual stand-up comedy. But this is what he says. He says it's the stream left was stopping you from doing all these jokes about extreme subjects. That's all you do. How were you able to get away with it? Who did you pay off? Um, You know, I... 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 (laughs) I, there's been a lot of talk about like cancel culture over the past, um, you know, quite a while at this point, but yeah, it's like a decade yeah. at, at the, now. But I mean, I just, I don't really think that there, I don't want to say there's no cancel culture because there is like, I mean, I think that, you know, like, especially right now with like people talking about Gaza, like there are people like legitimately, you know, have you know been dropped from their agencies and their management companies and you know but i i definitely think let's put it this way to the extent that cancel culture is real i i think that you're more likely to be canceled for leftist views than you are for like you know making a racist joke yes or as we alluded to earlier uh and people were bringing this up in response to seinfeld's comments because a lot of people on twitter did not like it they brought up the fact that Seinfeld, who is literally a billionaire with a capital B from his comedy, um, was never canceled for his very public um, affair with a much, much younger girl. He was 38 at the time when he dated a woman who was 17. She was still literally in high school. And this I remember seeing this on like a current affair and inside editions like Jerry Seinfeld's got a new love in his life and she's in high school and like people were pretty chill with it even though jerry he went on like howard stern twice to like defend himself but point being like he didn't get canceled for that he didn't get in any trouble for that like so and i so i don't know why he of all comedians who's never done humor that was super edgy like he seinfeld was on network tv it was the most popular show on tv and his stand his actual stand-up is extremely tame extremely tame so i I'm, and he has a new movie coming out about fucking pop tarts okay yeah. <laughs> like so i don't know like where is he feeling this pressure from the left like people generally like him. yeah no it's so funny to think about like you know you just can't say that uh why don't they build the whole plane out of the black box anymore you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah no he hasn't been canceled at all like his show is probably one of the most syndicated shows of all time and it's it's still a quite beloved show and uh yeah like netflix just paid like a gaggle of money just to get it a couple of years ago like he's richer than he's ever been more successful than he's ever been yeah it's it's pretty wild he's uh he's definitely very very successful and i i don't know i mean i'm not sure where this is coming from maybe just you know i think that sometimes when people talk about cancel culture they mean that you know they don't like people making fun of them kind of and like people have made fun of jerry seinfeld for dating a 17 year old which i I think is fair but you know (laughs) but like he hasn't he definitely hasn't been canceled for it i I don't know like i 
it, it, it's such an interesting time to talk about cancel culture because this debate has been happening in comedy for uh, years at this point. And we're now in the middle of all this, seeing what an actual repression of free speech looks like, which is not people making fun of you on the internet. It's like the cops um, dragging you away, shooting you with rubber bullets, um, you know, charging you with um, criminal you know, activity, uh, like we see some of the Columbia protesters held in solitary confinement. And, you know, like, I, I think it's just, it's very strange to talk about this, like, people made fun of me, and I am therefore canceled stuff. Like, when, when we're just looking at, you know, what very well may be like a complete redefinition of First Amendment rights in the United States. And this ties directly back to the Seinfeld household. Jessica Seinfeld, his wife, who a lot of people make this mistake. She's not the same woman that he, excuse me, girl that he dated when she was 17. It's a different woman. In fact, that girl went on to become a successful in the fashion industry. But uh, Jessica Seinfeld, his current wife, donated $5,000 more than anyone else. And this is uh, from Prim Thacker of the Intercept. Intercept. Uh, donated $5,000 to the GoFundMe of the pro-Israel UCLA rally. rally. Um, and at this rally, participants yelled, I hope they rape you and spat on and used the N-word towards pro-Palestinian students. Horrific video. You see them like attacking the in encampment. Uh, I don't think Jerry Seinfeld is going to get in any trouble for that or excuse or Jessica Seinfeld I don't think they're going to get any trouble at all and Jerry himself went to Israel and did like a little PR tour with the IDF a couple of years ago and it's just so strange like he is very like an outspoken supporter of a, of what is now a genocide but he's worried about like people saying that this joke is problematic or whatever like it's like people don't even talk about that like that's a very dated conversation too that's a very like obama era co conversation almost people are worried about like other shit at this point yeah. and i was like yeah i think that i think that that's true because people are worried about other shit and it's also true that just the industry has completely changed since the obama era in the obama era you know there were like there were uh king and queen makers who were like you know could you had to um, you know, get that, you know, comedy special, a comedy central half hour, um, you had to get noticed by like, you know, Netflix, but now it's totally different. It's like, you have to build your own following on social media. And then, you know, once you have, you know, many, many followers, like, you know, probably, probably if you have a million followers, you can get, you know, a special on, on Netflix or, you know, like, but it's just, it doesn't, like the, the importance of gatekeepers and people who are even in a position to decide if like work should be platformed or not. It's, it, it's just way lessened. Like, and that's good and bad. Like it's very good that, you know, people who are, you know, like not of the type that will be, you know, noticed and, and celebrated by industry gatekeepers, um, you know, can get their chance because like, obviously that includes, you know, like women, people of color, people who are, you know, leftists, people who just, you know, have, have a perspective that like, isn't gonna make like the, the bros who are, you know, the, <laughs> the executives be like, well, you know, like this is really going to kill it with our like, you know, 18 to 25 male demographic, you know, but like also like the right wing stuff, you know, can get like a lot of traction and, and like nobody can really stop you from doing comedy at this point. Like there is no cancel culture in, in that even way. So, even though some people should be stopped if, you, if we're being honest. Yeah. I mean, some people should be stopped, but it's like as long as you can build a fan base, like no one can cancel you. And that. You know, you could definitely lose out on industry opportunities, but like whether or not you can work as a comedian, like depends, you know, on if people will pay to, you know, see your work either on a streamer or on, you know, like, you know, a platform that, that you put out. And it's like if, if you can build that fan base, like, you know, you're you're basically untouchable, like people you can't you can't be canceled. Um 
Yeah. Yeah, like say if you had a, a very popular podcast, but then you got hired by SNL as like a day player, uh, and then you got fired, and a couple of years later they brought you back to SNL. Yeah. Did you really lose out on anything? Yeah, I mean it's it, it's just changed even even so much since then. Like you know, in terms of like I think you know Shane Gillis, who you were mentioning, like he's been able to build a huge fan base of people who like his stuff, and you know it's like. As long as you can do that, like you can really say whatever you want, which is which is good and bad. Like for me, I think yeah. it's probably most. Yeah, he good. was very big with my middle school uh, students. Very <laughs> yeah, I, I I think for me, it's probably mostly good that it's this way because it's like you know I am you know I'm I'm a woman, uh, well over thirty. I have leftist viewpoints. Um, you know I. I would not be somebody that at this point the industry would be like, oh, let's make her the next it girl. But like nobody can stop me from performing because people come to my shows, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. So you mentioned, you know, the industry and the kingmakers. Who is at the top of the industry now? And just the other day, a cover story came out for the woman who has been at the lead of female-led comedy, whatever that is supposed to be, for the past few years. Amy Schumer, folks. She's back. She's a Zionist. <laughs> and I, it's just so strange to me that for a lot of comedy comedians, their primary focus on social media is like advocating for a genocide, which is very strange to me. In fact, the, there's a Variety article called Amy Schumer can't escape backlash. She's okay with that, which if it was a title of an article about Amy Schumer a few years ago, would have been about her telling jokes about her period or something. Yeah. But here the backlash is about, and this article is by Rebecca Rubin in Variety, and we'll read a little bit of it. This article is about the backlash she's facing for being a out loud supporter of Israel's war on Gaza. Yeah, I read it. So it's so strange to frame it because it seems like this typical, you know, puff piece, but then it has to mention multiple times like genocide. You know, I mean, I so I saw that she was being profiled and I was like, okay, this is an example of like the industry not caring if somebody is getting backlash online but no it's very much because of the backlash to you know some of the really islamophobic stuff that she's posted okay so amy schumer was in the zone this was in march she was when she was filming on the street in Brooklyn for her upcoming movie, Kind of Pregnant, about a woman who pretends to be knocked up for attention. In one take, Schumer emerged from a subway station while answering a phone call and was interrupted by a stranger shouting from the sidewalk, fuck you, Amy Schumer, you're a Zionist, you love gem genocide. <laughs> During for, Shout outs to her, whoever that was, shout outs to her. During the four letter variety, disruptions of the four letter variety aren't unusual in a raucous place like New York. They're, they're just, I actually think that what I think being screamed, you're, you love genocide is unusual, but I, please. Continue. I mean, and probably not anymore. Like it's, it's, you know, like, <laughs> um, I mean, at least not for these, like these, these prominent figures, you know, like, like Chuck Schumer or like, uh, you know, any of, any of our Congress people, but I'll go on. Disruptions of the four letter variety aren't unusual in a raucous place like New York, though they're usually less pointed. Schumer didn't break character, refusing to stop working as the woman carried on. The actress finished the scene finally, packed up her stuff and went home to her husband and their four year old son. I didn't even raise my heart rate, Schumer says, over a brunch at Cozy Brooklyn Heights Tavern. A couple <laughs> days later, I didn't cry, nothing. Now, lines like that in the article make me think that the writer is out to get Amy because you could you did not have to mention that she was at brunch. Yeah. In that reaction. Yeah, I didn't. I, I, I was looking at that. I think I missed that first time where it's just like. But I don't know if, if the writer, you know, is maybe like so in, in the brunch mentality that she does not realize that that's funny, you know. Take the topic of the Israel Hamas war. Interesting that they call it that, but okay. Yes. Um, since the October 7th attack, Schumer has been scrutinized for her social media posts, which some feel conflate Palestinians with Hamas. 
Um, she also criticized, she was also criticized for sharing a video of Martin Luther King Jr. condemning anti-Semitism and saying Israel has a right to exist. Bernice King, the activist's daughter, responded to Schumer's post by saying that while she and her father were against anti-Semitism, she would, she was certain that he would call for Israel's bombing of Palestinians to cease, for hostages to be released, and for us to work for true peace, which includes justice. It's gotten to this place, Schumer says, where you can't speak up for other Jews without feeling like it's a slight to the conditions in Gaza. She's referring to the 32,000 plus Gazans. It, it's probably way more at this point, but okay. Um, 32,000 plus Gazans killed since the October 7th massacre and the million on the verge of starvation. And- See, like that line there made me kind of think that the author was trying to like, kind of put into context like yeah when she refers to the conditions which is what she calls it just the conditions the author thankfully highlights there's actually you know thousands tens of thousands of real people dying and millions possibly starving uh i'm actually i was actually a little bit surprised to see amy continue to double down on this sort of thing because she was one of the people who when october 7th ha- happened she was very online very into social on social media and she got some pushback with some of the as you said the islamophobic stuff that started to come out in those first couple of months and then she stopped talking about it essentially but now she's come back i guess uh because she has a a, was a new movie coming out or something and she's still like doubling down on this stuff it's like she didn't learn but she didn't learn she didn't moderate she just got quiet and now she's getting loud again yeah and mike yeah yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I, you know, I think that there's a very sort of specific tactic being used here in the next paragraph. She says, I don't agree with anything that Netanyahu is doing and neither do the Israelis. I know, of course, I think what's of course, what's going on in Gaza is sickening, horrifying and unthinkable. She, she adds, and I don't think it's OK to hate anyone because they were born Jewish. So it's it's a kind of double tactic of it's like that's, that's the only two options. Yeah, we have. yeah it, you know, that like. It's blaming Netanyahu and also making it seem like this criticism of, you know, Israel's actions is motivated by anti-Semitism, which, okay, maybe it is for some people. I'm sure there's definitely real Nazis in the U.S., but for like the majority of the student protesters right now, what they are protesting is, you know, like tens of thousands of people being killed, most of whom are women and children, and that doesn't have anything to do with hatred of, you know, any religious or ethnic group. It is good and just to protest um, genocide. Yeah, I forgot the the article actually does answer the question about why she's going on like this. And I'll read that part. Um, She's going on like this because moments earlier, a 20 something woman approached our table and addressed Schumer. Thank you for everything you're doing for Israel, the Brooklyn Knight said. I follow you on social media. I used to live in Israel and thank you. We support you. After the woman disappears, Schumer says, that moment you just saw, maybe 10 times a day that happens to me. You know, I have like mixed feelings about this. Okay. And I I realize I'm I'm about to get myself in, in trouble. But so let me explain what I mean more personally. Like, I think that. There are probably people who, you know, are Jewish that that do legitimately feel like the criticism of Israel is a criticism of them in the same way that people felt like the criticism of Hillary Clinton, you know, was like a criticism of, you know, that them because they were women and, you know, kind of people like sort of, you know, emotionally connecting to something in a way that that does like legitimately make them feel terrible. But, you know, just because they feel that way doesn't make criticism of Israel not legitimate, you know? So I I don't want to dismiss the fact that like there are people who who do genuinely experience um, these protests as anti-Semitic, but it it doesn't mean that they are, you know? Yeah, and my point was more like, if that happens, if people are complimenting you 10 times a day, 
then what are you complaining about? Yeah. Like, like, like <laughs> yeah. yeah, like you're not risking anything by doing this. You're in the majority. Like you're not fighting against anything. Like that's the, like, so what are you mad about? Anyway, it's just strange to me. Uh, maybe I'll get in trouble for this. That so many comedians, whether they're actors or stand-ups, are, you know, going so hard for a country, which if you, ju if I'm judging by the propaganda videos, there's not a single funny person in that time. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, the propaganda is so bad. Yeah. It's so terrible. So I do, like, I feel like just as a comedian, you would be a little bit offended. Uh, you would want to distance yourself, distance yourself from that. But I digress. But Kate, we've had you on for a while. I'm so happy you came, finally came on. Thank you so much for coming on. Where can people find your special? Um, so you can see it on Amazon and Apple TV. Uh, you can also buy it on YouTube. Um, and it's called Loopholes. You can follow me on social media at Kate.Willett with two L's and two T's on Instagram. Um, and that's where I post all my tour dates. And yeah, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. That's all, folks. Have a good one. Peace. Thanks. <laughs>